This is the second chapter of Roderick Chisholm's book, The Theory of Knowledge. This book was a very influential survey of the state of epistemology or the theory of knowledge. Episteme is the Greek word for knowledge uh, as of the late 20th century. So uh, Chisholm is using a sort of analytic methodology here. He is trying to analyze a bunch of concepts involved here, figure out what the logical relationships among those concepts have to be, use that to give definitions for the terms that he's interested in, and then see what he can derive from those concepts about the things that we care about in terms of knowledge and its related concepts. And this particular chapter is dealing with the concept of justification, which is important in epistemology. Uh, in fact, many epistemologists these days think of justification as more important than knowledge, even though knowledge is the concept that's in the name of the discipline. Okay, so here he begins on epistemic justification. The term justify in its application to a belief is a term of epistemic appraisal. It is used to say something about the reasonableness of that belief. So too are such terms as evident, gratuitous, certain, and probable. And reasonable itself may be a term of epistemic appraisal. So that is, he's pointing out that in all of these cases, all of these words are words that we use to say that some beliefs are better or worse than others. They're appraising them. Most epistemic concepts presuppose a single relational concept that may be expressed by saying, uh, so-and-so is at least as justified for us as is such-and-such. Such. Uh, the term expressions so-and-so and such-and-such such may be replaced by terms denoting believings and withholdings. A person may be said to withhold a proposition H, provided he does not believe H and does not believe the negation of H. The proposition that God exists is such that the theist accepts it, the atheist accepts its negation, and the agnostic withholds it. Okay, so here we have a bunch of terms that he's defining. He's defining believe, disbelieve, accept, withhold. So he's saying, saying that for every proposition, either you believe it, or you disbelieve it, you believe it's negation, or if you don't do either of those, then you withhold judgment. Uh, so withholding is just anything, that, it's the attitude you have to anything that you don't either believe true or believe false. And then now he's talking about uh, uh, a single relational concept, at least as justified. And here he is considering a relational concept as opposed to a uh, a sort of one place property. So you can think of the difference between being tall and being taller than. We can say that one person is taller than another without saying that either one is tall or without saying that either one is not tall. And similarly, he wants to say some attitudes are at least as justified as others or more justified than others without necessarily saying that either one is justified. Though presumably the at least as justified and just plain justified are going to be related to each other in some way. He's going to talk somewhat more about the logic of these things later on. So he says more justified, of course, may be explicated by reference to at least as justified. For to say that A is more justified for S than B is to say that it is false that B is at least as justified for S as is A. So we can see here he's saying, that more justified is like taller than, and at least as justified is like at least as tall as. And of course, since we know that objects have their heights arranged on a linear scale, so for any two objects, either one is taller than the other or they are equally tall, we can say that for one of them to be taller than the other, just is for the second one to not be at least as tall as it. Uh, and he's saying the same thing with justified. So here he is assuming without really justifying this assumption that justification exists on a linear scale like this, that one thing is more justified if and only if the other is not at least as justified. Another thing you'll notice here is that he's already using a bunch of letters as variables. This is like in a mathematical equation, um, except instead of X and Y standing for numbers, he's using S to stand for a person. I think S stands for subject, uh, the subject of the uh, belief, 
and then um, he can he's talking about propositions H or attitudes A, and so he's saying uh, an attitude A or B might be believing H or disbelieving H or withholding H, and H could be any proposition whatsoever. It could be that grass is green, or that I had uh, oatmeal for breakfast, or that it's going to rain tomorrow, or that Paris is the cap capital of Germany. These are all different propositions, some of which you might be justified in believing, some of which you might be more justified in believing than others, some of which you might be justified in withholding judgment of, some of which you might be justified in disbelieving. Uh, okay, so then he says, here are two clear-cut examples of this use of more justified than. St. Augustine suggests that even though there may be ground to question the reliability of the senses, so here he's noting this point that many other philosophers have noted that our senses are not perfectly reliable. So there's ground to question their reliability. But St. Augustine suggests most of us are more justified most of the time in believing that we can rely upon our senses than in believing that we cannot rel uh, rely upon them. So that is, Augustine is saying, uh, let's consider these attitudes you might have. You might believe that you can rely on your senses. You might disbelieve that you can rely on your senses or you might withhold judgment about whether or not you can rely on your senses. And I think Descartes and many others tell us that the most justified attitude to have is to withhold judgment on whether or not we can rely on our senses. But St. Augustine is saying, out of the other two, believing and disbelieving, you're more justified in believing that you can rely on the senses than you are in disbelieving that you can rely on them. So maybe withholding is the best, but Augustine is claiming believing is better than disbelieving, even if it's, be it's second best. Second example, even if there happens to be life on Venus, most of us are more justified in withholding belief about the presence of life there than we are in believing that life exists there. And uh, here he's writing, this book is originally 1966. I think this particular edition is from 1989, but at any rate, even very much up until the present, there is certainly no clear evidence that uh, makes believing that there's life on Venus more justified than the other attitudes. Though I do suspect there might be enough inclinations to make it more justified to believe than to disbelieve. Uh, but he's probably right that withholding is the attitude that is most justified given our current evidence. We've been speaking about what a person or subject is justified in believing. We may say, for example, that the person S is at least as justified in believing P as, in, as he is in withholding P. Such statements about the person entitle us to say something about the epistemic status of the relevant proposition for that person. And so here, he, what he's going to do over the course of this chapter is use this very basic concept of one attitude being more or less justified than another to define a whole bunch of categories of the degree of epistemic support we can have for a particular proposition or that a particular proposition can have for us. He's going to say from this one relation of more or less justified for the attitudes and these three attitudes of believe, withhold, disbelief, he's going to say there turns out to be 13 different categories of the strength of justification that we can have for a proposition. And so here's his first example. For example, if S is at least as justified in believing P as he is in withholding P, then the proposition P is beyond reasonable doubt for S. Being beyond reasonable doubt then is one of many epistemic categories into which a proposition P may fall. So here, of course, beyond reasonable doubt is the concept that is appealed to in cr the criminal justice system in the United States, England, and various other places that are based on this common law tradition. They say, you don't have to be absolutely certain someone is guilty to convict, but it does have to be beyond reasonable doubt. And Chisholm is interpreting beyond reasonable doubt as meaning that believing is more reasonable than uh, withholding even. So doubt is withholding. And he's saying that you can be uh, beyond reasonable doubt as long as believing is the most justified attitude to have.
OK, so now he starts with uh, these categories in more detail. The first category he comes up with is the counterbalanced. If a proposition is counterbalanced for a given subject, then neither the proposition nor its negation has any positive degree of epistemic justification for that subject. And here he gives us this more formal definition, D1. He's putting this in the um, sort of uh, indented text to indicate that it's a formula to be read all at once. And then in particular, he uses this equals DF. And this equals DF is saying, he's not just saying that the thing on the left happens to be the same as the thing on the right. He's saying that the thing on the left is defined as being the thing on the right. And uh, so, for instance, uh, it might be that uh, my favorite animal is the dog, but my favorite animal is not defined as being the dog. My favorite animal is defined as being whatever animal I like most. There might be a fact that the fa my favorite animal is a dog, but the definition is doesn't involve dogness. The definition involves animalness and favoriteness. And here he's saying the definition of being counterbalanced is uh, for a proposition P to be counterbalanced for a person S means that this person S is at least as justified in believing P as in believing the negation of P. And S is also at least as justified in believing the negation of P as in believing P. That is, belief and disbelief are exactly equally justified for the person. And I think he's going to assume that in this case, if, if neither of belief nor disbelief is better, then withholding is going to be the attitude that is in fact best to have. So here he says, the Greek skeptic, Pyrrho of Elis, seems to have held that all propositions are counterbalanced. Uh, so, that is, Pyrrho is such a strong skeptic that he thinks there is never any more reason to believe something than to disbelieve that very same thing. For everything, believing it and disbelieving it is just as reasonable, or I guess he's going to say just as unreasonable, you should withhold everything. Some of the later Greek skeptics, the academics, so these are the followers of Plato in his academy, they expressed this doctrine by saying that all propositions can be shown to be counterbalanced. But this would be contradictory. The assumption that we are justified in supposing that every proposition is counterbalanced presupposes that that proposition, namely that every proposition is counterbalanced, is not counterbalanced. So yeah, here he's, he's diagnosing that if you're going to be a skeptic, you have to be careful about what exactly you mean by skepticism. It's one thing to say that every proposition is counterbalanced. It's another thing to say, I know that, I can justify that, I can show that every proposition is counterbalanced because giving that justification is stating that that very proposition itself is not counterbalanced. And he gives another uh, footnote for this. Montaigne writes that the academicians differ from the Pyrrhonists in maintaining that some things are more probable than others, a position the Pyrrhonists will not allow. Then he goes on to side with the Pyrrhonists saying, the doctrine of the Pyrrhonists is bolder and much more likely. So there are some things more likely than others. So here is Antoine Arnaud, who's the author of um, a, an important logic textbook of the 1600s, criticizing his contemporary Montaigne, who supported the Pyrrhonists over the academics uh, uh, because he thinks the Pyrrhonists are more likely to be right. But by admitting that one thing is more likely than another, more justified than another, he is denying the Pyrrhonian claim. The Peronian claim is that nothing is more likely than anything else. And so that's an extremely strong form of skepticism, uh, which uh, Chisholm is, I think, arguing against here. The term Pyrrhonism is sometimes used to refer to the following doctrine. Trying to avoid having unjustified belief is more reasonable than trying to have justified belief. Pyrrhonism, as we will see, is not presupposed by the present book. So this is a slightly different way of putting it, but um, some people say there's this question, is it, is it worse to believe something that turns out to be false, or is it worse to fail to believe something that turns out to be true? And what I personally would say is it's going to depend a lot on what that thing is that you believe or don't believe, that there are some things where believing it could cause big problems if it's not true. 
Whereas there are other things where failing to believe it could cause big problems if it is true. And so it's going to depend on the thing that we're talking about. But uh, some philosophers have tried to make this very general claim that it's always better to avoid having a false belief than it is to try to have a true belief. And that tends to lead to a certain form of skepticism. And the, the Peronians say, express this by saying that it's never better to believe something or to disbelieve it. It's always better to withhold. Second category, the probable. If a proposition is not counterbalanced for us, then either that proposition or its negation is probable for us. We here take the term probable in that sense in which all of us understand it, whether or not we know anything about epistemology, statistics, or inductive logic. That is the sense we may have in mind when we ask ourselves such questions as, is it probable that I will be alive a year from now? And is it probable that it will rain tomorrow? So here he's just saying probable in the sense of being reasonable to believe, uh, regardless of whether or not there's any mathematical concept of probability involved here. And many contemporary philosophers, including myself, think that it is best to use the mathematics of probability theory to try to understand this ordinary epistemic concept of probability, but there are important things to be careful about here. And he's just interested in the ordinary epistemic concept of something being more probable than something else. And he's going to say, to say that a proposition is probable for us in this fundamental sense is to say simply that we are more justified in believing that proposition than in believing its negation. Our definition then is this, D2. P is probable for S is defined as saying S is more justified in believing P than in believing the negation of P. And so he says, uh, and so note here, he's not saying, he's not yet comparing believing or disbelieving to withholding. It could still be most justified to withhold, but if there's any difference between believing and disbelieving, then whichever one is better is probable. So he says, if it's probable for you in this sense that you will be alive a year from now, then you are more justified in believing you will be alive a year from now than in believing you will not be alive a year from now. This fundamental sense of probability has been the concern of epistemologists since at least the time of the Greek skeptics. Propositions which are thus probable for a person S and which are merely probable for us, that is, they have no higher epistemic status than being probable, may yet be such that some are more justified for us than our others. It is, at best, only probable for you that you will be alive a year from now. So he's saying here, uh, you, are prob you may be more justified in believing you'll be alive a year from now than in believing that you won't be alive a year from now. But he thinks that uh, it's at best only probable. So withholding is still more justified than believing. I'm not so sure I agree with that, but let's accept that he, uh, what he's saying here. He says, nevertheless, you are more justified in believing that you will be alive six months from now than in believing that you will be alive a year from now. And I think here he's thinking, well, if you are alive a year from now, then you'll definitely be alive six months from now. Whereas it's at least possible for you to be alive six months from now without being alive a year from now. And so you're more justified in believing the statement that is true in more circumstances. So in this case, we may say of two propositions, each of which is merely probable for you, that one of them is more probable for you than the other. We must take care to distinguish this fundamental epistemic sense of probable from the sense that that expression has in statistics and in inductive logic. In those disciplines, probable is defined in terms of frequency of occurrence, sometimes in terms of the limit of relative frequency in the long run. But the epistemic concept of probability, although it is closely connected with the concept of frequency, is a concept of a very different sort. We consider this topic in more detail in chapter six. So here he's taking this idea, which is a common idea in statistics, though uh, one thing I'd like to note is that not all statisticians accept this account of probability, but at least one conception of probability in statistics is you only have probability for events that can be repeated in a whole bunch of independent trials. So if I'm rolling dice, there's a probability that it comes up double sixes, which is we could figure out by rolling those dice many times and figuring out what fraction of those times come up double six. 
that is not what's going on with the proposition that I'll be alive a year from now, because we can't repeat that proposition uh, a large number of times. Either I will survive to the end of the year 2022 or I won't. Uh, you can't take many different examples of Kenny in the year 2022 and see how many of those times I survive and how many of them I don't. We could take lots of different people and see how many of those people survive through the year 2022. But those are all different people. And you might think that some of them are more likely to survive than others. So that's not what the probability is about. The probability about me is a purely epistemic matter. There's just this question, how justified am I in believing that I'll survive through the year? Or how justified are you in believing that I will survive through the year? And it's possible that some of you will be watching this video more than a year from now. And so you will then perhaps even have access to facts about this that I don't currently have access to. But probable is when it's more justified in believing than in disbelieving whether or not it rises to the most justified attitude to have. That which is beyond reasonable doubt. We've already said what it is for a proposition to be beyond reasonable doubt. D3, P is beyond reasonable doubt for us, is defined as meaning S is more justified in believing P than in withholding P. The category of being beyond reasonable doubt is illustrated by the proposition that the building in which I now find myself will be here tomorrow. This proposition is not evident. He's going to define evident in a few minutes. But for me, and I hope that for others, the proposition is such that believing it is more justified than withholding it. That is, believing, so he thinks, believing that I will survive at least another year, that's more justified than disbelieving, but maybe not as justified as withholding. Whereas believing that the building will survive for a day, that's something that is so well justified that it's more justified to believe it than to even withhold judgment on it. Obviously, there are some true propositions which are such that we are more justified in believing them than in withholding them. So for instance, if it's true that this building will in fact survive another day, then that's a true proposition that we are more justified in believing than in withholding. Are there also false propositions which we are more justified in believing than in withholding? We will find that this may well be true. Or more exactly, we will find that if philosophical skepticism is false, and if, as a matter of fact, we do know many of the things about the world that we now think we know, then it is quite possible that some false propositions are such that it is more reasonable for us to believe those propositions than it is for us to withhold them. So here he's saying, uh, consider anyone who's in a building. I think in most cases, we are it is uh, beyond reasonable doubt that the building you're in will survive for another day. But there were some people in the World Trade Center on September 10th, 2001, and presumably it was also beyond reasonable doubt for them that that building would survive for another day. And in that case, it turned out to be false. So if we're ever this justified in believing things, and he thinks we are, then at least sometimes we will be this justified in believing things even though they turn out to be false. So justification is no guarantee of truth. He's, he's asking for a concept of justification that is somewhat fallible. And I think this is our ordinary concept of justification. Okay, so now he's going for yet a higher level of justification, the evident. The evident is that which when added to true belief yields knowledge. This is uh, perhaps a cryptic statement if you haven't uh, thought about the philosophical project of what it is to define knowledge. Um, and he's going to get to that in chapter 10 of this book. Um, but he's responding to some ideas from Plato and from this philosopher Edmund Gettier about what it is to know something. The knowledge is not just belief, and it's not just belief that happens to be true. It also needs to have a strong level of justification. And he is claiming that he's going to define that in terms of being evident, and he's going to define evident in terms of justification. So here he says, there are presumably nine planets. And now, of course, I should add that footnote that uh, at the time he was writing, people had discovered Pluto, but they had not yet discovered Eris or Quirwar or any of the other bodies that are the same size as Pluto and orbit the sun at around the same distance. And uh, so, uh, 
if he knew about those bodies, he would say, you would have to say either there's a dozen or more planets, or you would not count any of them as planets and say there's only eight planets. That's what most people think these days. Though I should also add, there are some astronomers who believe there might be another planet at least as large as Earth, way out, uh, so far out that we haven't seen it yet. So it's definitely not certain that there are eight planets. And at the time he was writing, he may have been justified in believing that there were nine planets, but it turned out to be wrong, at least given the definition of planet we eventually came to. But he says, the person who believes that there are nine planets, but does not know that there are nine, has at least true belief about the number of planets. But a person who knows that there are nine planets has something that the person who has mere true belief does not have. The traditional way of putting this difference is to say that for the person who has knowledge, the true proposition believed is also evident. One should not confuse the locution P is evident for S with S has adequate evidence for P. The latter expression, but not the former, may be taken to mean those things that are evident for us make P beyond reasonable doubt for us. Uh, so that is, he's saying, to have adequate evidence to believe something is just to say, the evidence that I have makes this belief more justified than either withholding or disbelieving. So that's what it is to have adequate evidence for believing is for believing to be the most justified attitude. But he thinks, being evident is stronger than just that. He says an evident proposition, like one that is beyond reasonable doubt, is a proposition which is such that one has more justification for believing it than withholding it. And the evident has this further feature. For any two propositions, if one of them is evident, then believing the one that is evident is at least as justified as withholding the other, whatever epistemic status the other may have. So that is, we have to be thinking, there's three attitudes you can have. You can believe things, you can disbelieve them, or you can withhold. And he thinks for different propositions, different of these attitudes might be more or less justified. And he thinks for some propositions, namely ones that are counterbalanced, withholding is the most justified attitude to have. But he thinks there are some propositions for which we can be so justified in believing them that we are even more justified in believing them than we are in withholding on any proposition. So that is withholding can only get up to this level of justification, but he thinks belief can get to a higher level. And uh, anything that is that high a level of justification, that's what it is to be evident. He's not giving us any argument for this. He's just stating this and hoping that we go along with him. And I think it's interesting to see what happens if we go along with him, whether or not we eventually decide to agree with him. So he says, the evident may be characterized this way, D4. P is evident for S, is defined as meaning, for every proposition Q, believing P is at least as justified for S as is withholding Q. So that is, uh, something is only evident if it's so certain that you're more justified in believing it than you could be justified in withholding anything. So he says, if it is now evident to you that the sun is shining, and I think if you're standing outside on a sunny day, imagine that situation. You're standing outside on a sunny day. He says, in that case, it's evident to you that the sun is shining. The proposition that the sun is shining is so well justified for you that you'd, be, uh, that you'd still be better off believing that than you are in withholding on a proposition you have no evidence for. So he says, we may say you're at least as justified in believing that the sun is shining as you are in withholding any contradiction or withholding what is epistemically impossible, say the proposition you would express by saying, I'm not thinking. This conception of the evident reflects the rejection of Pyrrhonism. So Pyrrhonism, remember, was the idea that withholding is always the most justified attitude for any proposition. And in fact, maybe even stronger, you're never more justified in believing anything than you are in disbelieving it. We have noted that a proposition may be beyond reasonable doubt and also false. We will find that the same is true of the evident. It is possible that there are some propositions which are both evident and false. So that is even this high level of justification is still not a guarantee of truth. And he says, Pierre Bale may have been the first to have called attention to this fact. He's another French philosopher of the 1600s uh, who is active in this 
logic textbook, the Port Royal logic. Um, and so he says, this fact that there are some propositions which are both evident and false, to see that, just imagine a character who's in the Matrix or in the Truman Show or any of those other um, movies that gives us a skeptical scenario. Those people seem to be, it's just as evident to them that the sun is shining as it is to me. And in their case, it turns out that it's false. So something can be evident and still be false. It would be totally unreasonable for Neo not to believe that his world is real until he eventually comes on this new evidence that he gets from Morpheus. And, uh, uh, but these basic things that are just so well justified for us, Chisholm's idea is that those things provide the evidence that justifies our other beliefs. So he says, this fact that something can be evident and yet be false makes the theory of knowledge more difficult than it otherwise would be. And it has led some philosophers to wonder whether, after all, the things we know might not be restricted to those things that are absolutely certain. So some people think, and I think this is Descartes' idea, that you can't know something unless it's absolutely certain because merely being evident is still not a logical guarantee of truth. But if we do in fact know some of those ordinary things that we think we know, for example, that there are such and such pieces of furniture in the room, I know there's a table here and a desk here and a computer here, uh, at least I think I know that. Uh, I also think I know that the sun was shining yesterday. I know that the earth has existed for many years. If I do in fact know those things, then we must reconcile ourselves to the possibility that on occasion, some of those things that are evident to us are also false. Because if, if I can have knowledge of those things, those things are evident. There are people for whom those things have exactly the same status that they have for me namely people in the matrix or people who are brains in a vat or people who are just uh, undergoing some massive illusion. Or even if there aren't, there at least could be such people. And so someone could have exactly the same epistemic status for those beliefs as me, and yet those beliefs turn out to be false. That's a sort of fallibilist conception of knowledge. And it is what most uh, epistemologists in the general analytic tradition have, uh, have think have thought these days. So now he's going to give yet a higher level than evident, the certain. Epistemic certainty may be characterized this way. P is certain for us is defined as, for every Q, believing P is more justified for us than withholding Q. And in fact, believing P is at least as justified for us as is believing Q. So that is, he's saying certain is just, is, is a term he's reserving for whatever is absolutely highest on the ladder of justification. That if there are two propositions that are certain, then you are equally justified in believing them and you are more justified in believing them than you are in just, justified in withholding on anything or on believing anything that's not certain. So this concept is illustrated by those propositions about mental life that are sometimes called self-presenting. And so here, I think he's thinking of examples like Descartes' example, the fact that I am thinking currently is certain for me. This is not merely evident. This is even higher justification for me to believe that I'm thinking than for me to believe that the sun is shining right now. Because I do know, I can imagine a way in which I would have all the same sorts of evidence and sensory data as, as I do without the sun shining. Whereas I can't imagine a way for me to have all the same experience without me thinking or existing. So that is certain. He says it's illustrated by certain logical and metaphysical axioms that form the basis of what we know a priori. So a priori here means prior to experience, independent of experience. The, we use this Latin word prior, even though it's not about a temporal sense of being earlier in time. It's about a logical sense of being um, more basic. So we will discuss these types of certainty in the following two chapters. Okay, so now he's getting to the formal epistemic principles. We have taken at least as justified as, as an undefined locution. Obviously we have to take some locution as undefined. This may not be initially obvious to you, but think about what happens when you go to look up words in the dictionary. Any definition involves more words. So you look up the definitions of those words, 
you're either going to get to definitions that go in a circle or you're going to get to words that don't have a definition. And so he's saying in philosophy, if we're going to analyze any concepts, we do have to take some concepts as unanalyzed. Some of them are basic. But the fact that we have not defined it does not mean that we cannot say anything about what is intended by it. Uh, and so here he's being inspired by some ideas in mathematics that the mathematician David Hilbert says, when we're doing geometry, we can't define what we mean by a point or a line or a plane. Euclid thought he was giving definitions, but it turned out uh, the things that he tried to say as those definitions don't actually help us. However, Hilbert noted, Euclid does give us a bunch of axioms. And then Hilbert says, anything that satisfies those axioms, we can count as points, lines, and planes. And Hilbert is interested in this because he's interested in non-Euclidean geometry, things like you might have thought line means straight line on a surface, but we can also have lines on the surface of the earth and do a different sort of geometry where it turns out on the surface of the earth, no two lines are parallel. And that's different from Euclidean geometry. And so similarly, Chisholm is saying, we can't define what justification means, but we can still say some things about it and use that to understand the concept. If we set forth certain axioms for the locution, we can illuminate just what it is that we intend to express by it. Let us note then some of the basic principles governing the use of, at least as justified as. We first formulate two very general principles telling us that the justification relation is asymmetrical and transitive. So his first axiom, A1, this is the asymmetry axiom. If A is more justified than B for us, then B is not more justified than A for us. So this is part of this idea that there's justification is arranged in this linear fashion. If one thing is more justified than another, then the second can't also be more justified than the first. And that's different from certain other relationships. So for instance, you could have an, a relationship in a food chain where one animal eats another, and it could be that the second animal also eats the first. I've heard, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that this is true with giant squids and certain types of whales, that both of them will eat each other. And so if that's the case, then the relationship of eating each other is not asymmetric, but he claims the relationship of more justified than is, just like the relationship of taller than or more than. A2, if A is more justified than B for us, and B is more justified than C for us, then A is more justified than C for us. So again, this is part of what it is for justification to be arranged in a linear way. Other principles will tell us more about the strictly epistemic content of at least as justified as, and will throw light on some of the most fundamental questions of the theory of knowledge. I will list three such principles. The first two are anti-Peronian, and the third may be called the objectivity principle. Commitment to these principles is essential to the view set forth in this book. And we'll get to those. So first, the two anti-Peronian principles. William James wrote, there are two ways of looking at our duty in the matter of opinion, ways entirely different, and yet ways about whose difference the theory of knowledge seems hitherto to have shown little concern. We must know the truth and we must avoid error. These are our first and great commandments as would-be knowers, but they are not two ways of stating an identical commandment. They are two separable laws. And to see that, think about what's involved with this. One of them, we must know the truth. That means we should believe lots and lots of things in order that we can know all the true things. The other, we must avoid error. That tells us we must avoid believing lots and lots of things so that we can avoid error. And he says, both of these things are pulling us and we care about both of them and think about the criminal justice system. We both want to find guilty the people who are guilty and let go free the people who are not guilty. Both of these types of things are mistakes. And in the criminal justice system, we've specifically decided it's better to let a guilty person go free than it is to lock up an innocent person. That doesn't mean that we completely avoid either one of them. Both of those bad things happen. And yet we are trying to make sure that we get mostly one type of error rather than the other. And James is saying here, these are two things that we can have as goals of our system. And 
a system that is optimized to do one may be worse at, uh, at doing the other. So he says, one fundamental issue may be put by asking, which of these two commandments should be given the greater weight? Or more generally, is it more reasonable to try to reach the truth or to try to avoid error? It is sometimes said that playing it safe is always more reasonable than taking any chances. And this would seem to be the attitude of the Pyrrhonist with respect to what it is reasonable for us to believe. But the following principle is anti pyrrhonian A3, if the conjunction P and Q, conjunction here just means two statements put together with an and, if the conjunction P and Q is beyond reasonable doubt for us, then believing P and Q is more justified for us than believing P while withholding Q. This principle describes conditions under which one is more justified in believing more rather than in believing less. In other words, it tells us that playing it safe is not always the most reasonable course. So if, if it, it was always better to avoid error than to seek the truth, then it would never be more justified to believe two things than to believe one and withhold the other. But he says sometimes it is more justified to believe two things. Sometimes it's beyond reasonable doubt that there's a conjunction that are both true. And if that's the case, then that goes against the Peronian idea. Given this common sense principle, we may say that if believing P is more justified than withholding Q, and if believing Q is more justified than withholding Q, then believing the conjunction of the two propositions, P and Q, is more justified than believing just one of the two conjuncts and withholding the other. If John is a musician is beyond reasonable doubt, and if John's brother is a musician is also beyond reasonable doubt, then accepting the conjunction, John is a musician and John's brother is a musician, is more justified than accepting just one of the two conjuncts. The principle also applies in a significant way to propositions we would not ordinarily express as conjunctions. Suppose that I see a person and I see a person sitting are both justified for me. So here he's thinking, I see a person sitting is equivalent to a conjunction. I see a person and that person that I see is sitting. In this case, I see a person is safer than I see a person sitting. Because of course, there are circumstances in which I see a person and they're not sitting. There might be circumstances in which I see a person and I think they're sitting, but actually they're doing some sort of crouch right next to the chair. Uh, and so I could sometimes, there are some cases in which I would go right to just believe that there's a person without believing that they're sitting. And yet nevertheless, our principle tells us out of these two propositions, both of which are beyond reasonable doubt, one of which is richer in content, but less safe than the other, accepting the safer proposition while withholding the one that is richer may be less justified for us than accepting the one that is richer. So that is, if you see a person sitting, you're more justified in believing that there's a person sitting than in believing that there's a person and withholding that they're sitting. Our second anti peronian principle is this, A4. If anything is probable for us, then something is certain for us. He doesn't give any justification for this. And uh, this is one that many philosophers, particularly Bayesians like myself, will question. And as, but as we'll see, this type of principle is one feature of what is called foundationalism in the theory of knowledge. Many philosophers attempt to dispense with it. We will discuss its implications in chapters three and nine. Okay, now he's getting to one other interesting principle, the objectivity principle. We turn now to what may be called the objectivity principle. This principle pertains to the fact that we can sometimes know that we know. If knowledge is justified true belief and we ever know that we know, then we sometimes know that we are justified in believing. And if we can ever know that we are justified in believing, then epistemic statements say, it is evident for us that the sun is shining, or just, I'm justified in believing that the sun is shining. These statements are statements that are either true or false, and statements that can be known to be true or known to be false. It follows that epistemic statements are, in DJ Mercier's terms, objective. They are not mere expressions of confidence or of other feelings. So here he's contrasting objective statements with purely subjective statements. So for instance, the statement that 
Beethoven's music is better than Beyonce's, or that Beyonce's music is better than Beethoven's. These are subjective. I might have a feeling that one of their music is better, and you might feel that the other one's music is better. And neither of us, many people at least think, neither of us would be right or wrong about this. And neither of us could know that we're right because there is no fact about whether we're right or wrong. Similarly, some people even think this is true about moral claims. Some people think that, um, that when I say it's right to be kind to other people and it's wrong to uh, uh, exclude people who are not members of your society, some people think that's an objective fact, but there are some people who think that's just our societal opinion and other societies have different opinions and there's no fact about which one is right or wrong. So some people had thought that all normative claims, claims about better or worse or right or wrong, some people thought that all normative claims are subjective, that they're just expressions of our feelings. But here he's saying epistemic claims are normative. They're about what is better or worse. It's better or worse to believe things. Uh, and if you can know that you know, then you can know that you're justified. And that means you can know that it's better to believe than not to believe. And if that's possible to know that, then that means that this normative claim that it's better to believe than to disbelieve can be objectively true. So here he's given an argument that if it's possible to know that you know something, then there are some normative claims that are objective. So here he says, a further consequence would be that if epistemic statements are to be construed as normative statements, then contrary to one widespread philosophical belief, some normative statements express what is true or what is false and are capable of being known to be true or known to be false. Under what conditions then could we obtain knowledge about epistemic justification? Bertrand Russell once wrote, the degree of credibility attaching to a proposition is itself sometimes a datum datum here just means given. It's the singular of the Latin word whose plural is data. I think that we should also hold that the degree of credibility to be attached to a datum is sometimes a datum, and sometimes, perhaps always, falls short of certainty. So here, Bertrand Russell, this is uh, in the footnote, it's, it's from human knowledge at scope and limits. Russell's expression, degree of credibility, may suggest our level of justification, but he uses the expression more narrowly and indeed, may be said to define it in terms of one, the probability or confirmation relation, and two, the evident. He writes, when in relation to all the available evidence, a proposition has a certain mathematical probability, then this measures its degree of credibility. So that's a way in which Russell is thinking about this somewhat differently than Chisholm. Russell's thinking about it in a more mathematical sense, and Chisholm is trying to do logic with his definition, but thinking of it somewhat differently but they are after similar ideas. But in what sense is epistemic justification a datum? Certainly we do not experience a quality that might be called the evidence of a proposition. So when I'm just considering something, I don't immediately know how justified I am in believing it. Uh, but the objectivity principle tells us what kind of justification we can have for beliefs about justification. And so here's his further axiom, A5. If S knows that P, then if S believes that he knows that P, then S knows that he knows that P. So of course, it's possible to believe that you know something without knowing that you know it, because it's possible to believe that you know something while just being wrong. I might believe that I know you took the last cookie, but if it was actually someone else who took the last cookie and I was misled, then I don't know that I know that you took the last cookie. In fact, I don't know that you took the last cookie, I would be wrong. Uh, but he says, when you do know something, and then further, when you reflect on that knowledge and believe that you know it, he thinks that's all it takes to know that you know something. And this principle that if you know something, and if you think about it and believe that you know it, then you know that you know it. This is sometimes called the KK principle for knowing that you know. And this is this principle has been debated a lot by epistemologists. Um, some people think this is obviously true, though some people think there are some problems for it. But what could we say to one who does not believe that this principle is true? We could cite the following pre-analytic data. One, people often know that they know. 
So he's writing at Brown University. I know that I know that I'm in Rhode Island. And similarly, I know that I'm in Texas. And I know that I know that I'm in Texas. And two, people know such things without having any specialized information about epistemology or the theory of epistemic justification. So here's his second premise. In order to know that you know something, you don't have to have thought about epistemology. Hence, three, when we know that P, it may be the case not only that there's an experience that makes it known to us that P, but also that there's an experience that can make it known to us that we know that P. But what would this second experience be? Our objectivity principle tells us in effect that the second experience is the same as the first. What else after all is there to make it known to us that we know that P? Footnote, since our formulation of this principle contains the word no, we've gone beyond the concepts that we have defined in terms of at least to justify that. In the final chapter, however, no will be defined in terms of these concepts. So here he's trying to give us an argument for the KK principle. And there's probably some things we might question. One of them is this rhetorical question, what would the second experience be where he's just assuming we answer, I don't know what else that experience could be. So there is no other experience. It has to be on the same basis. And if it's on the same basis, then maybe we get the KK principle. Okay, so now he's going to wrap this chapter up to the 13 steps. We note finally that our undefined epistemic concept, that is more justified then, and the axioms that may be provided for it, enable us to set forth a hierarchy of epistemic concepts. This hierarchy involves 13 epistemic categories, 13 steps or stages, each capable of being occupied by countless propositions. To see the point of such a hierarchy, let us turn back to the concept of the evident. An evident proposition is one that is justified, but there are many justified propositions that are not evident. Indeed, many propositions that may be said to have a very high degree of justification are not evident. For example, it may be evident to you now that you have walked today and that you also walked yesterday and the day before that. You may have very good grounds for accepting the proposition that you will walk tomorrow and the day after that, the proposition may be strongly supported by induction. Induction is the idea that if you've observed something occur on a bunch of occasions, then you can be justified in believing that it'll keep occurring on future occasions. And he's saying, even if this does provide justification and good grounds for accepting that you'll walk tomorrow, it is not now evident to you or to anyone else that you will walk tomorrow. I mean, after all, you could decide to just never get out of bed tomorrow. For no one now knows that you will walk tomorrow. He's connecting evident to knowledge in ways that he'll get to in chapter 10 of the book. The proposition that you will walk tomorrow may be beyond reasonable doubt for you, but nothing that you can find out today can make it evident for you today that you will walk tomorrow. Again, he doesn't justify this claim. He's just making this claim that uh, nothing today can make anything like that about the future evident. It could be beyond reasonable doubt, but it can't be evident. Remember, evident means more justified than anything can be justified in withholding judgment. The difference between what is evident and what is beyond reasonable doubt, but not evident, is not a mere quantitative difference. It is a qualitative difference, like that between being in motion and being at rest. That is, something that's at rest is moving at zero miles per hour, something that's in motion is moving at maybe only one mile per hour. There is a quantitative difference there, but he's claiming there's also a qualitative difference because being at rest is a perfectly precise concept. Now, of course, anyone familiar with the work of Galileo or Einstein might question whether there even is such a thing as at rest and might challenge these quantitative, these qualitative differences that uh, Chisholm is talking about. And that's a challenge to the entire framework, perhaps. But uh, we can put that aside. Chisholm is saying, uh, when two things are balanced, you can even think about this like on a, uh, on a scale or a seesaw. If you have two weights that are perfectly equal, there is a qualitative difference in the behavior from the case where even one is just slightly higher or lower than the other. Because once one of them is just slightly heavier than the other, it'll tilt all the way. 
and uh, it's only if they're perfectly equally balanced that they'll stay still. And so that's a qualitative difference in addition to a quantitative difference. And that's what he's claiming is this difference between being evident and being beyond reasonable doubt. There's a qualitative difference here. Uh, propositions that are counterbalanced may be thought of as occupying the zero level. Those that are probable may be thought of as occupying the lowest positive epistemic level. Above these are propositions that are beyond reasonable doubt. So counterbalanced means no better to believe than to disbelieve. Probable means better to believe than to disbelieve, but still probably better to withhold. Uh, beyond reasonable doubt means better to believe than to withhold. Evident means better to believe than anything could be to withhold. And certain means the very highest that anything could be about being believed. Uh, so he says above the probable or beyond reasonable doubt, still higher are the evident, and at the top of the hierarchy are those that are certain. There are two additional positive steps or levels that we have not mentioned. One is the step between that which is probable and that which is beyond reasonable doubt. Propositions in this category may be epistemically in the clear. A proposition is said to be epistemically in the clear for a subject provided only that S is not more justified in withholding than in believing. So that is probable means the best thing to do is to withhold, but if you had to either believe or disbelieve, believing is better. Beyond reasonable doubt means better to believe than to withhold. There could be things where believing and withholding are both equally fine. So if your evidence could ever permit both believing and withholding, then you're in the clear. That's this state that's better than probable, but less than um, beyond reasonable doubt. The other positive step falls between the evident and the certain. Propositions in this category are said to be obvious. So remember, evident was more justified than in believing than in withholding anything. And certain means more justified in believing than in believing anything else. And obvious, a proposition is said to be obvious for a subject provided only that for every proposition Q, S is more justified in believing P than in withholding Q. Oh, I think evident was at least as justified in believing P as in withholding Q. And obvious is beyond that, more justified in believing P than in withholding Q. So obvious, uh, so evident is at, belief is at the highest level that withholding can get. And obvious is even higher than that. And then certain is the highest. So far we have one zero level and six positive levels. We may now go on to distinguish six negative levels. The negative level that a proposition occupies is a function of the positive level of its negation. Thus, the highest negative level that a proposition may, P may occupy for a subject is that of being such that its negation is probable. And the lowest negative level is that of having a negation that is certain. Our epistemic hierarchy then may be put this way. Certain, obvious, evident, beyond reasonable doubt, epistemically in the clear, probable, counterbalanced, probably false, in the clear to disbelieve, reason, reasonable to disbelieve, beyond reasonable doubt to disbelieve, presumably, evidently false, obviously false, and certainly false. The first five categories are such that each it includes, but is not included in the category immediately listed below it. And the last five categories are such that each includes, but is not included in the category listed immediately above it. A further principle that is needed to complete our hierarchy of 13 steps may be summarized this way. If a proposition P is epistemically in the clear for us, then P is probable for us. That is, if believing is at least as justified as withholding, then believing is at least as justified as disbelieving. He didn't state the other, that, uh, that if believing and disbelieving are equal, then withholding is higher, but I think he's assuming it. Uh, there are some things that he's assuming that uh, 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 at least withholding is always better than at least one of the two of believing or disbelieving, sometimes better than both. Uh, and so he says, if agnosticism is not more justified than theism, then theism is more justified than atheism. And if agnosticism is not more justified than atheism, then atheism is more justified than theism. The point of including this principle here is to ensure that whatever is epistemically in the clear is also probable. To see the point of such a hierarchy, let us turn back to the concept of the evident. 
An evident proposition is one that is justified, but there are many justified propositions that are not evident. Indeed, many propositions that may be said to have a very high degree of justification are not evident. For example, it may be evident to you now that you have walked today and that you've also walked yesterday and the day before that. You may have very good grounds for accepting the proposition that you will walk tomorrow and the day after that. The proposition may be strongly supported by induction, but it is not now evident to you or to anyone else that you will walk for tomorrow. tomorrow. For no one now knows that you will walk tomorrow. The proposition that you will walk tomorrow may be beyond reasonable doubt for you, but nothing that you can find out today can make it evident for you today that you will walk tomorrow. Here, he's making a bunch of claims. He's not really justifying most of them, but if we think they sound plausible, then something like this hierarchy makes sense. So if we can accept that there is this concept of justification, if we can accept that there are these concepts of belief, disbelief, and withholding, and if we accept that whenever belief and disbelief are balanced, withholding is better, and whenever believing is better than withholding, then withholding is better than disbelieving. If we accept those sorts of things, then we're going to end up with something like these 13 categories. And then there's a further question, which, if any, propositions ever end up in one category or another? How do they do that? He's going to claim that the status of the evident is the one that drives everything else, that our senses give us lots of things that he thinks are evident, and that evidence makes other things probable and some things beyond reasonable doubt. And he's going to try to give a theory of how all that works. We don't have to accept all that, but I think it's helpful still to look at this taxonomy he's giving us and just consider these concepts and think, uh, even if I can't be certain of almost anything, can I still have better or worse categories? And I personally think that in the end, it'll be better to think about these things in a much more continuous quantitative way than in this qualitative way with 13 precise levels of the hierarchy. But it's still helpful to think about what does it take to be justified in believing something? Does that justification guarantee its truth? In general, no. But nevertheless, that justification can make it more reasonable to believe things and uh, to disbelieve them or to withhold. And in particular, if we can know any of these claims, if we can ever know when we're justified in believing things, then that means justification is a normative status that is nevertheless objective. And so this would refute the claim that all normative things are subjective. And so this is an interesting point to think about. Maybe epistemic normativity is the only kind of objective normativity, or maybe if we accept epistemic normativity as objective, maybe that suggests that perhaps we should accept moral normativity and aesthetic normativity as also objective. But that's all beyond the scope of this chapter.